first slide, very complex slide, that I will not have enough time to explain. I'll try to take some concept to illustrate a, a, a quite different way, a complementary way of conceiving the uh, epidemic of chronic disease that we are witnessing all over the world. And I think that we must take some basic concept. The first one is that the very first nine months of our life are uh, the most important of our life. We should not forget this. I think that the fetus is getting his fetal programming, his epigenetic programming. That is its way of reacting to environment in the very first month of its life. So if we disturb the fetal programming, we can have a lot of consequences. And we must consider that the embryo and the fetus are organisms quite different from child and adults. And that the fetus is a lot of differentiating cells and an environment, which means pollutants and electromagnetic fields, can interfere with these cells, differentiating cells, in a quite different way. So I think that perhaps we must try to uh, look at epigenome and uh, epigenetics in a new way. Epigenetics is not a part of genetics. Epigenome is not a part of DNA, it's the contrary. The DNA is a little part of a complex network, which is the epigenome, which is continually reacting and changing owing to the information that we get on it. So the way of considering diseases must change. In a, we must conceive a complementary uh, paradigm of pathogenesis and carcinogenesis in which the epigenome and the fetal programming and the programming of our cells is continuously changing because the environment is changing too quickly. So in this way, the first concept is that we are currently facing a paradigm shift in biomedicine. We have considered for 20, 50 years that DNA as the code and the key project for the assembly of our phenotype now we must consider that our phenotype is rather the result of the interaction between the information coming from the environment and the information deeply inscribed inside the DNA. So we must think that the epigenome is the most important place of this interaction and that there is no stable change in our phenotype both physiological and pathological, which is not environmentally induced, modulated by the epigenome, and conditioned by the DNA. The DNA is only the dictionary. It's not so important as we have thought for a half century. The key concepts are developmental plasticity and fetal programming now. So the fetus can program itself for life, in a predictive and adaptive way, owing to the information he is receiving. This is quite different. And perhaps we can look at diseases in a different way. The theory is developmental origin of health and diseases. A lot of diseases that we are seeing augmenting all over the world, obesity and diabetes too, autism and Alzheimer and even neuropsychiatric diseases, and allergies, and gluten sensitivity, and not gluten celiac diseases, and in allergic diseases, and cancer could be the consequence of a bad response or a mismatched response to an environment that is changing too quickly and the fetus cannot react in the correct way. So of a bad program, this is the theory. You see that a lot of diseases that are augmenting all over the world could be the consequence of all these. The, the key concepts are epigenetics. We must not consider epigenetics just as a minor part of genetics. This is the contrary. The DNA is the little part of a, this complex network. 
the epigenome is the quite the most important place in which the information coming from outside, environmental signals, interfere with DNA and with the information that we have had for billions of years in our DNA. In fact, genes need to be told to switch off and on. In fact, all these dynamic epigenetic networks that are in the cell induce the genes to program themselves in a different way in the first time of our life. This is a complete, way, complete different way of conceiving our life and a complete different way of conceiving environment. Environment is a stream of information coming from outside, electromagnetic fields and chemicals and pollutants and so on, that interact with our cells at various levels and that force our epigenome to change all the time. But in the very first time of our life, in which the epigenome is much more plastic, the impact of information is much more important than in the rest of life. Electromagnetic fields, both extremely low frequency and radio frequencies and so on, can impact on DNA, changing and uh, on specific, specific DNA sequences. For example, they can impact on the promoter of the heat shock proteins. And it is very interesting that you see that the, 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 the sensitive region of HSP70 promoter is upstream from the thermal domain of the promoter and is not sensitive to increase the temperature. So it's quite different the way in which electromagnetic fields can induce changes in DNA and the, in the epigenome. It's not only thermal effects. But the most important thing to remember is the fetus is particularly vulnerable to changes in the external and internal environmental, owing to its capability and its necessity to define its epigenetic setting in, in a predictive and adaptive way. This is perhaps the most important way of conceiving all this. We are a clone of cells in which all the cells get their DNA from their parents, but the epigenome changes from the first day owing to the information coming inside to the fetus. That's why a neuron is completely different from a lymphocyte. They have the same DNA, but they have a very different epigenome, only because they have been informed in a different way in these nine months of life. And if all this is disturbed by electromagnetic fields or by chemicals, the epigenetic set, the epigenetic problem is probably disturbed for all life. So, some uh, researchers and scientists and Belyaev have shown that this is very important, that the strongest microwave effects are always observed in stem cells which means in not differentiated cells, which means in fetus. In fetus, we have the maximum of reaction, of changes, of epigenetic changes, owing to exposure to electromagnetic fields. For example, very recently, some researchers have found that exposure to high radio frequency radiation impairs neurite outgrowth of embryonic neural stem cells, disturbing the connectome instruction. And the same, re, re, other researchers have found the same from extremely low frequency electromagnetic fields that affect transcript level, which means transcription expression of genes, of neuronal differentiation related genes in embryonic neural stem cell, which means that the connectome, the way in which we construct our neural networks is disturbed by electromagnetic fields in the very first time of life, which means in the two last months of our, of our fetal life and in the two hour, uh, years of our life after birth, in which we have synaptogenesis, which is the most important way of considering the construction of our neural 
of our brain, of our connectome. A lot of pollutants, a lot of chemicals, but, a lot, but electromagnetic fields too can discharge the migration of neurons and the synaptogenesis in the very first time of life. The brain grows in the fetus at an amazing rate during development. At times during brain development, 250,000 neurons are added every minute. And every neuron, when we at birth, almost all the neurons that we, the brain will ever have in our life are in place. And we have 30 billion neurons at birth. And every neuron has already 2,000 uh, or 3,000 synapses at birth. So if we don't understand that the most important problem of our life is in the last two months of our fetal life, we cannot interfere with this augmentation of a lot of diseases at perhaps to the new environmentally induced diseases. It's not only the chemical burden passing from our mother, which is absolutely very important. We have a lot of persistent pollutants in, in the, in, in the uh, blood coming from placenta, but also the exposure to electromagnetic fields. This is scientific reports of nature. A growing overload of electromagnetic radiation is adding to chemical toxic burden. We demonstrate that the fatal exposure to high frequencies radiation from cellular telephones lead to behavioral and neurophysiological alteration that persists into adulthood. Because uh, electromagnetic fields can change the synaptogenesis, and, the, and we have an augmentation of glutamatergic synaptic transmission, which means that the child can, be, uh, um, can have anxiety for life, not only at the beginning of life. You must look at the, uh, at the there is not much, not enough literature about the way in which electromagnetic fields and chemicals interact and can give a lot of effects, but we must consider that this is the reality, that we are exposed continuously to all these kinds of pollutants. Cognitive impairment and neurogenotoxic effects in rats exposed to low intensity microwave radiation and alteration of cognitive function in rats after long term microwave exposure. You see, there is a lot of uh, literature, recent literature, can, that show all these. Many studies indicate the relationship between exposure to, to microwaves and permeability of the brain blood barrier, cerebral blood flow, stress response, neuronal damage, and so on. If the idea of an environmentally responsive genome still steers debate, the notion that epigenetic marks are transmitted across generation, this is the real problem, is even more provocative. We have thought that sperm was only a vehicle for DNA. That's not true. The sperm is a vehicle of a lot of information through microRNAs, for example. And these microRNAs can inform the sperm about, and a lot of information is not uh, put away. We, 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 it, it was a bad concept. The most amazing discoveries that impose a radical revision of the dominant models, both in biomedical fields and in evolutionary biology, he, he is a French scientist, he was Lamarck, I think that we must think about him in the next days, next years, do concern the transgenerational transmission of acquired characteristic by epigenetic adaptive targeted modification of the genome of the gametes by microRNAs and exosome. It's quite a different way of considering. A mother could also transmit to the fetus the effects of environmental exposure during pregnancy. That's why we must look now at fathers. And you know that the copy number variation in sperm in, in, in autism, and even in schizophrenia, you find a lot of copy number variation in some genes controlling synaptogenesis, and you find the same copy number variation in the sperm of father. They are copy number variation ex novo, de novo. You don't find 
in the parents, but you find in the sperm of fathers. So we must try to understand that this um, transmission is real, that a lot of uh, that human spermatozoa exposed to, uh, to radiation have decreased motility, morphometric abnormalities, increased oxidative stress, and so on, that's sure that they have a lot of epigenetic changes. Uh, for example, if you look at testicles, you can find in sperm, for example, plasma exposed to cell phone radio frequencies. You can find plasma membrane that becomes leaky and porous to proteins, cytoplasmic mitochondria that generate excess of rose, nuclear DNA and chromatin that undergo breaks and damage, and so on. So, all these means that the variation in our phenotype are not genetics, not only genetics, but genetics is only a little part of this variation. The, fet the disturbed fetal programming by a lot of inducers, electromagnetic fields, chemicals, maternal stress, and even exposure of parents and of father can have a, ma a, a, a great role in this transition, in this epidemiological transition. The problem is that a new scientific truth does not triumph by, conv by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it.